And I would entertain a motion. I move that we accept the minutes as submitted. Seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Nice job, Al. Unanimous. <laughs> Moving on, we have our agenda items. And our first mm -hmm. item is for Chief Hurlbut to make a presentation for the fire department operating budget. And uh, I will turn this over to the chief. Good evening. For you? Please. Wherever you most come. Uh, what specifically are you looking for? Just a narrative of the overall budget? You want to start with capital? You want to go to how do you, how do I think budget? a narrative, Chief, if that's uh, satisfactory to you and if you're comfortable with that, sure. give the uh, townspeople an opportunity to see uh, what you have in mind for the coming year. Sure thing. So the FY25 operating budget for the fire department, go over the cost drivers, which uh, drives the budget up this year. So the first increase is under the salary line item for the fire chief. Uh, requesting an increase of 13378 which is the 3% cost of living increase um, and an 8% longevity pay. Uh, that comes out to $9,729. Uh, that is really secondary to the, in the CBA contract that was recently approved by the full-time firefighters in the town of Sterling. Um, they obtained that and typically throughout my career as chief, I've had parity with what the union has received, so that is the main reason for the increase on that. I've been fire chief, I'm going on my 23rd year now. I've been a member of the department for 38 and a half years. Uh, I think I've proven my dedication and commitment to the town of Sterling, and um, I feel that's really the, the rationale behind making that request. So that's the first thing. Under column full-time wages, this is gonna be a little bit of a change from what I originally presented to you because it's on the fire side, it's been reduced by 25,000. So column full-time wages, the request is increased by $37,845, which equates to 4.36%. It includes a contractual obligation of $33,966 for the full-time firefighters. That includes step increases, 3% cost of living, longevity, merit, holiday, and overtime expenses. It's important to note that there was no wage increases uh, based on their contract, which was approved for fiscal 24. So the contract goes from fiscal 24 to fiscal 26, um, but it was approved after town meeting vote last year. So there were no increases um, to accommodate for any of those uh, from their CBA into the contract. So we're not only catching up for the FY24, but we're also including the increases for FY25. Um, <clears throat> expenses, on the expense side, we went up uh, an increase of $4,600, which was 2.14% for fire department expense. The largest cost increase is for $3,000 under firefighting supplies. Uh, and that's nothing more than based on actual cost increases from our daily cost of what we do for the uh, cost of doing business. Dues and meetings line will increase by 2K based on increases from um, the dues that we pay for the different organizations have gone up uh, over the years, so that accounts for that. Heating line item went up by $2,000 to account for um, the last uh, three years of oil and heat cost expense increases. And the communication line item went up by $1,500 uh, based on our code red emergency notification system. This is, we've been, been in code red for seven years and this was their first cost increase. Um, as you know, we over the years I've broken down, even though the, the bottom line fire department is both fire and ambulance, I break down the ambulance um, as a separate uh, entity for the budget presentation. So under that, uh, increases include chief salary increase of $1,556 based on an assumed 3% cost of living increase and for the 8% longevity pay that comes out of the fire chief salary. Call and full-time wages, requests went up $11,747, which is 2.29%, and that includes the same reasons, um, contractual 
holiday overtime and step increases for those contracts and includes in wages also includes our call firefighters and any per diems that work open shifts at the fire station expenses went up 17.66% uh, uh, which is $17,445 and the biggest reason for that is a one-time uh, expense of 13.5 so 13,500 due to the fact that in December one of our CPR so it's called a Lucas it's an automatic uh, CPR machine uh, that reached its end of life in December of 2023 and was found through normal uh, and we do annual preventive maintenance on it so that is uh, 13,500 and it was after I had already submitted capital budget so I put it in my normal operating budget uh, again, that'll be a one-time hit, so that'll be coming off of the line item for next uh, fiscal year. Education line item increased by $3,000 uh, because next fiscal year, so every other fiscal year, um, the majority of our emergency medical technicians and paramedics renew um, their recertification, so we pay for their relicensure fees. So um, that goes up exponentially every other fiscal year to account for, for that. Um, and that is the that is the overview of the increase to the firefighter operating fire department operating budget. Chief, could you restate the amount on fire wage increases? The dollar amount. On <laughs> $37,845, and that represents a 4.36% increase. Thank you. Do you want to transition to capital, or other questions on this? I have a question on this, Chief. Yep. The difference between a, a, a paramedic and a... Uh, um, EMT? EMT. Yes. What, what is the basic difference? In the training, um, well, training is is, is quite um, number of hours. Either of you? Um, so, uh, hi. This is Eric Aries. He's our uh, EMS coordinator. Hey, Eric. So, hi. Welcome. So, a paramedic requires a minimum of two years of training, usually through an accredited training institution or a college course. EMT is anywhere between three to six months of training. So, already there's an exponentially higher level of training required for a paramedic. Paramedics have um, much higher responsibility. Um, we are capable of doing more advanced mm -hmm. level of care. We essentially do all the stuff that a doctor can do in the back of an ambulance. We do cardiac monitoring, intubation. Um, at some levels they can do ultrasound. Um, we do not have that capability yet, but it is something that we do have the potential to do. Um, medications, um, defibrillation, those sorts of things. So. There's a very big difference between a paramedic and an EMT, both through training and skill set. How many paramedics do we have on staff? Uh, roughly 15. Wow. That's terrific. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Eric, I have one more question. Yes. I, I am told related to that paramedic that we provide fairly extensive services to Clinton that does not have those capabilities. Am I correct? You are correct. Yeah. But I, I, don't have the, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. I believe the chief does. Um, but there are communities that we service that do not have ALS level care. And are there other communities that we service beyond Clinton? Yes, Lancaster. Lancaster. Yep. Well. And we also back up. So the way EMS as a whole works as a system is that we all back up each other. Just like if our ambulances are out. Lemonster's paramedics will come in to help us. West Boylston's paramedics would come in to help us. We do the same for the communities around us. Yep. So, so who makes the call as to whether an EMT or a paramedic is required? So it starts with the uh, emergency medical dispatch. It starts with dispatch. So they have a criteria of the type of call, and that criteria flags whether or not it's a what we call a basic life support call. Yeah. Or an advanced life support call, and that's dictated by the Department of Public Health. Oh, okay. Yep. Sorry to bother everybody, no. but that's very interesting. That's Thank fine. you, Chief. Okay, you want to go to Capital, uh, Lynn? Do you have any? Sure. Uh, I, uh, Dave's answered my 
questions extensively. Does anybody else from the committee have more questions? Well, if he wants to just make a presentation. I, I, can, I can present quick. So, again, I met with uh, Lynn and Liz. It's, uh, I appreciate the time they came down. So, similar to anything, I think uh, part of one of the biggest parts of my job is to educate exactly what we do and what we need. And it's great that they came down. We spent well over an hour going over the needs. And um, I think they, they can appreciate after sitting down and better understanding um, why we go after some of the stuff that we do. So this year, um, so for the FY25 request, it includes self-contained breathing apparatus, air pack replacements. Um, last year, that was a line item ask for uh, $400,000 this year, um, we pared that down to two hundred and nine, dollars and that's because um, bottle replacements, we're doing that in a, a staggering, we stagger the years of the bottle replacements so the town doesn't get one big hit. So we reduced those bottles off the cost of the air packs this year, so they were just going for the harnesses and the air packs themselves, and the bottles continue to be staggered out every five to ten years. So that doesn't. So we're based on that. We were able to reduce that line item from four hundred thousand to two hundred nine thousand. The other side of that is we were also going for three thermal imaging cameras. Um, we obtained a grant for fifteen thousand five hundred dollars, and um, that grant paid for two out of those three thermal imaging cameras. So I was able to reduce uh, that line item for two thermal imaging cameras as well. So. Um, you know, part of what we do, we try our best to, before we come to the, before the capital committee with any major request, we usually attempt to see what we can do to obtain stuff through grants. We've been successful in some years, and other years we haven't. So, um, this was, we tried for three years to obtain a grant for these um, self-contained breathing apparatus air packs. We were um, unsuccessful, uh, and these packs need to, they're basically, they've reached end of life at 15 years, and they'll be at 15 years. And, in 2025 so it's important um, that's basically one of the largest life-saving next to the structural firefighting gear that the firefighters wear the self-contained breathing apparatus is probably the single most life-saving uh, piece of equipment that they wear next um, this um, so that has been on the five-year plan even though we attempted to do it and um, through grants the next one that's been on for five years is to replace a 20-year-old hydraulic tool on ladder one um, that's uh, also known as a Jaws of Life. Currently that is a tethered tool, so that has a, um, a portable hydraulic uh, motor and 100 feet of hydraulic hose. Uh, we're uh, proposing to replace that with a hydraulic tool that's battery powered. Uh, that is for 27500 uh, You did that on Engine 4 last year, um, and you, um, we moved this capital item out to this fiscal year. The next one is um, F3 is to replace the mini split HVAC units in the bunk room and kitchen at the fire station. Both of those are failing and unfortunately with the system that they use, the, I'll call it back the, the um, fluid or Freon that they use for the system is very expensive now and at least in the bunk rooms the, there's a leak uh, behind concrete wall. So rather than busting the station up, um, we went out, we did a similar thing, if you remember last year, to the, to the day room. The system um, fails every couple of months. Uh, we get a HVAC company to come in, we spend three, four, five thousand dollars to recharge the system. Um, it's just much more cost efficient at this point to replace the system with <laughs> these mini split units. Um, so that's everything for fiscal 2025. Do you want me to move on to the other fiscal years, George, or just stick no, with 25? So those are the three requests for... What was the replacement amount for the mini split? Uh, $28,000. For That's for both units. So broken down, uh, the kitchen unit is $17,550 due to its size. The kitchen also services half of our meeting room. And then we have two bunk rooms, and that total cost is $7,418. And then we priced out to have an electrical contractor come in to do the necessary wiring for that at 3032 so the total cost is $28,000. Thanks for the detail. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dave, for all. I <coughs> disturbed his weekends with a bunch of questions, so I appreciate all your input. So, so based on those questions, is, mm -hmm. was there any follow-up that anyone needed on any of the answers? I mean, I, I tried to get as much detail 
I tried to provide statistics as needed. Um, as you know, over the years, I'm very detailed oriented, very passionate about the budget, so I hope the answers were, were presented to you in a way that's both understandable and helps you make the decision that we need. I just have uh, one question. First of all, thank you for all your service. Um, the grant for the cameras? Yes. What was the name of the grant? I'm just curious. It's the, uh, so it's the State Firefighting Equipment Grant. Okay. So last year, um, through that grant, we um, were able to obtain some um, rapid intervention equipment and um, rescue struts for the, the rescue truck. We replaced the 30-year-old uh, rescue struts that were... So, very fortunate to have some grant opportunities. Commendable job, Chief, in detailing your uh, needs. Thank you. Chief, Chief one more question. Uh, in recognition of the excellent training that your uh, paramedics have and the fact that you provide ALS services for Lancaster and Clinton, has there been any discussion about special compensation or helping your department out financially? Uh, Due to the fact that you have those so one of the things I think it's important to note on uh, especially on that mutual aid paramedics we get we charge the communities for that so we don't charge the patients so that's three hundred dollars for each intercept every time we make a patient contact so I think that's important to note so we're not writing off any of our mutual aid ambulance calls that's actual that's uh, that's revenue so last year. So, as Eric stated, even though we, we provide ALS to Clinton, Lancaster, West Boyles, and Lemonster, Princeton, and Bolton last year, um, the most calls have been to, to Clinton. So, when you saw some of the statistics where um, it shows that we went out to mutual aid ALS and FY23, um, you know, overall the statistics showed. 746 times. We only did a total of uh, patient contacts of 380 mutual aid. So even though we get called and that shows an incident, it doesn't mean we're always going. We're getting canceling. So these communities get there, they determine they don't need the paramedics, they're able to handle it at the basic life support level. Um, or timing wise, it doesn't make sense for us to continue and um, where they can load the patient and get to the hospital before we get there. So just for, for your knowledge, in FY23, mutual aid to Lancaster was $68,700. I mean, for Clinton, which is basically one full-time equivalent in, in funding. Uh, to Lancaster, was $23,450. Um, but just so all of you know, um, Clinton is in the process of, they're attempting to, to go ALS level. Um, the issue becomes like anything else, is it's a, it's a funding. It's something in... So years ago, and the reason you see it more is years ago, um, Clinton would just take their patients and transport them. But under the same criteria, when George asked about what dictates an ALS call, they're bound by the same rules by the state of Massachusetts. So they're required to at least call somebody that has that advanced level of care for their patients. Um, and I think it's important to note that the way our medics and the way we operate, it doesn't. If we're saving lives in Clinton, Lancaster, or West Boston. It's a life save. It's not just about Sterling. And um, I don't know how many of you pay attention to our social media pages, but last year our paramedics saved eight, eight people that were that were dead upon their arrival, and they brought them back wow. to life. So, so having the service is incredible. And being under the fire department since 2003, Sterling's been providing advanced life support levels since I got to town in 1985. So it's not a new service for the town. It's just that now it's. Uh, I think it's more focus because of the amount of times um, people are calling for the specialized service because frankly people are getting sicker. So. Do you see the, the ambulance receipts going down as Clinton staffs up themselves? I think there are ways off from that but I don't because the majority of our receipts come from from local revenue. But I, I think that, but to answer the, the original question that's a guaranteed revenue for us every time we go mutual aid. As you know, if we're patient billing, some are we write off a, a, a good amount every year, and that's from you know patients that might not necessarily pay. Um, people, Medicare, you know, what we bill, we receive much different for a Medicare and Medicaid patient. So there's a lot of variables with the ambulance billing, um, but every time we touch a patient on mutual aid, that's guaranteed revenue. That service is commendable, and especially the 15 
train paramedics on our spot. So the last thing, Joy, as you know, um, under the normal budget is this year we, we were looking to add two full-time firefighters, uh, paramedics, um, working with Bill. I present to the select board next week. It looks like it, you know, they've asked me to, to pare that down to, to one. But in the statistics that I've been providing to you, you can see that Sterling as a, as, as a whole is, is, our numbers are low for the number of full-time firefighters based on number of calls and what our... I'll say departments of our same size have for personnel. So it's something I think as a town we need to look at in our call, number of call firefighters and EMTs, and that's down significantly. And uh, one of the answers I gave to you is why are our mutual aid numbers up? Is it, it's everybody around us is hurting. You know, our, a lot of our bordering departments, they don't have much for call departments anymore. So we're still fortunate and blessed that we still have uh, people that are on the call side. But we need to. You know, we need to plan for the future. You've got five of your most active people in the town of Sterling will be 65 in the next four years and, and be retiring. So, you know, you take that and lose that as full-time equivalent or, or people coming back after, I'll say after hours. So after 6 p.m., that's a significant loss to the town. So that's something that, as fire chief, I'm, I come to you early and, and we need to plan for that. And um, that's the benefit to town. It's, it's not just about benefiting the fire department, it's about benefiting the town and protecting our citizens. So that's why you see that from me and you'll continue to see that from me every year. I need to advocate for what's right, what's best for our town. We appreciate it, Chief. You've done a super job. Thanks. Thank you. No, I was actually just on that point, I just so said Lieutenant Kokonak is like the stats I give you. He does a lot of that, so I just wanted him to... <laughs> Okay, Lieutenant, go. Everybody needs to okay. <laughs> All right. Um, no, just specific to the staffing component. Um, we last hired full-time staff in, uh, where we first advocated to hire full-time staff in 2020. Uh, Chief Robert uh, was seeking to get two positions. And at that time, um, similar, you know, it, it's, a, it's a tough ask for sure. So uh, ultimately they were questioning it. And as part of that request, I had done a study at that time that kind of showed that if you look at our area and the departments in our area and um, the population, the, the, the staffing of those communities, including Sterling, based on population and based on call volume, at that time we could justify, uh, we, we were below average and we could justify hiring up to four and still be right in that average, and I'll share that with you if you would like, right there. And that was one that we did in 2020. Um, so, in, with the chief's request this year, I kind of revisited that study to kind of see where um, where we fall. And uh, basically, on the average ratio for our area is about two full-time firefighters, firefighter paramedics, for about. Uh, every 1,200 citizens, population-wise, and four full-time firefighters for every 530 calls. So that's uh, looking at the towns of Auburn, Westboro, Ayr, Southboro, Paxton, Westminster, Rutland, Northboro, West Boylston, Holden, and Sterling. So it's just kind of a sampling of um, other fire departments in the area that provide ALS level of service, uh, have an interstate highway that go through them, which has an impact on um, what we're asked to do, um, you know, things like that. So. When I did that, um, when I did that that study, the data is on the back, and I'll show you a, a, a modernized version of that chart. <clears throat> we could, if we hired four this year, uh, we would still be um, below average relative to call volume. If you use that as the driver towards doing that that calculation, um, and certainly hiring four. Um, we'd still be be below average, and that, that holds true as far as the, the population component as well. So um, I think it's important that we look at look at that figure and look at that relationship between the other communities around us, because it, it shows trends. Um, like Chief Robert mentioned, that the call department uh, we've we've done very well getting as far as we've have with our. Uh, so, having the full-time staff supplemented with the call department. But there's towns around us, specifically West Boylston and Lancaster, that their call departments are down to 
two or three people um, in there at the point where they're just they're having to make significant changes in a short period of time. I think the data supports, it definitely supports two people this fiscal year. I s argue that it probably supports looking at a five-year plan and seeing where, um, you know, how we kind of offset that information that I just presented you. Um, but again, I just wanted to, you know, I think the chief's being conservative with his request for the two that, that he asked for um, and, and uh, specifically. So I just wanted to share that information. That's all. Thank you. A question. Are yes. those adjacent towns that you mentioned, are they driven to the low numbers due to their budgeting in the town? Or are they can't? When you say driven to the low numbers. Are you talking about the? You, 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 you indicated that you know that they're down to very few staff or yep. to handle the call. It's a cultural thing. To be honest, it, it's. I think it, it ties into the same components that the tr you know the trades. Electricians can't get help. Uh, carpenters can't get help. Plumbers can't, and I think the fire service is kind of falling into that same circumstance. Um, the the culture isn't. Uh, we don't have people that are in town working in town like they used to that were available to come to calls during the day type of thing. People ha are so committed to their full time jobs that it's difficult to get up in the middle of the night to go to a, a call. I think that's a factor as well, but I think there's a lot of cultural type things like that that, that kind of play into it. Um, more than budget. I'd say more than budget, yeah. It's, an, it's a international trend. It, it's not local to yeah. Worcester County or Massachusetts. Yeah, we hear about various aspects of that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's global. Thanks for clarifying that, by for sure. Yep. I, I just might add, <clears throat> customarily more is always better. However, there are financial constraints that we yep. also have to consider. So, the the need is one thing; the uh, possibility is something else. Well, and which is why I, you know, I, we've demonstrated this as going back to far uh, as far as 2020, as far as the the need goes. Um, I, I I take concern in kicking the can down the road because I think ultimately it's going to lead to a bigger problem down the road versus managing it now in small bites. Um, it's my own personal opinion, but I think it at least needs to it needs to be on the table and it needs to be looked at. I appreciate you're looking at if you look if you kind of look at the dynamic at what happens the communities in like the 495 belt. I'll use the town of South Rose as an example. We did in Sterling we did 2017 calls last year with seven full time firefighter paramedics. The town of South Rose did about 1,500 calls, I believe. They have a full time staff of I think it was 20 21 22 in order to, to do 25% less call volume that we do because of the situation with the call department and things like that. That's a big disparity. Um, and I think this, you need to, it needs to be managed year by year and um, kind of the best of both worlds and we need, need to be met in order for us to navigate through that. I don't want to comment about the comparison of household incomes either. No, understood. Yeah, understood. But it doesn't negate the problem. No, a fire is a fire. It, it, I don't it care what town it's problem. No, you're absolutely correct. But like I say, there are financial constraints we all have to live yep. with, too. And it's just like schools. You know, a, a five to one student to teacher ratio is probably better than 20 to one. Yep. Who knows? Yep. But I thank you. Sure, thank that you. Very enlightening. You. Thanks. And Chief, thank you very thank much. You. Okay, I'd like to uh, move on, and what I'd like to do is just shift the next two and have the school first, and then the Board of Health after the school department. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. Bye, guys. Is, is there a representative from the school committee here? Uh, <laughs> um, I'm Jimmy Winters. I'm the newest member. Um, You're all alone? I am. I am. And I don't have much to offer. This is my first budget season, so I'm really just here to learn and listen. Um, the opponent. Um, yeah, so I'm just here to listen. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm really excited about this budget season. Um, I think it's going to be a great year. Um, it's going to be a great year for the Board of Health and 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 the Board of Health he can call us on why we asked you here. Yeah, I think we uh, sent out a letter to you earlier today, Jamie, talking about 
uh, se several aspects uh, that we wanted to, to cover. And, and one of them is centered around adherence to the foundation budget and what we can do to get closer to adhering to the foundation budget that was just put out uh, by the state uh, to live with. So we're trying to uh, see, see what uh, the school committee thinks about that idea and what the school committee, uh, you and your, your two other school committee members can do about trying to influence the budgeting process that's going to be coming up. I know we have a, a meeting at the end of February here and then I think we have another presentation on March 13th about that. But trying to influence to get closer to that foundation budgeting uh, practice for the WRSD. Uh, Sterling, I think, is one of the two highest per pupil costs in the region. And the reason that we bring this up is to try and sort of equalize the disparity with the other three towns that see a much lower cost per pupil than we do. So, so we'd like to hear some comments on that, Jamie. Sure. Um, so I don't really have too much to offer. Like I said, this is my first year. This is kind of the first time I've gone through this process, um, so I'm learning a lot as I go. Um, what I do understand, though, um, Houghton in particular is a Title I school, so that could affect some of the budgeting reasons um, for why we would see um, increased costs cross versus other schools. And why does Title I affect um, it? I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Jamie, are you at all familiar with the whole budgeting process of uh, the school district, how it goes from foundation budget and uh, to discretionary spending, or being your first season, is this kind of out of your yeah. Okay. Yeah, it right. is. So I'm not like super prepared. I just wanted to come and, and learn and listen a bit more, just as it's being my first time. Okay, just a real capsule summary. Essentially, the the budgeting process of schools is the Department of elementary and secondary education comes up with a formula and they dictate to the region and to the participating municipalities what the foundation budget is. That is their opinion on what it's going to cost the region to teach the kids to an adequate uh, education level. And that is proffered onto the region that they must spend that much money. For your region this year, it's around $86 million. From that, they then do a calculation for each municipality within the region, dictating how much each municipality must contribute towards that foundation budget. So Sterling is mandated to contribute X number of dollars towards the region, and that is from Desi. The region then does it, what we refer to as discretionary spending over and above the foundation budget. So the foundation budget is fixed by the state. There, you have no control over that. There's a transportation component, which you also have no control over. That's contractual. And there's a debt service that you have no control over. So there's three pieces that come together that the district has no control over. Then there's the discretionary part, where you, through the school committee and the superintendent, gather information, just like we do in a municipality, on, okay, the state said it's going to cost this much, but in reality, it's going to cost this much more. And that's what we're pretty much requesting from you to carry with the school committee and the administration, that this is a very tight year for all municipalities. And the state has mandated that your district has to spend, has to, $1.5 million more than it did last year. You don't have a choice, okay? Does he said so? You gotta do it. And what we're suggesting is, if you can go to administration, ask them if they can contain their overall growth to that 1.5 million from last year, and then we can work with that number to fit it within the municipality budgets. That's pretty much why we asked you here, sure. is to carry that message and uh, 
try to impart that on the administration. I know Holden had sent a letter to administration earlier this year requesting a 3.1 or less percent increase. We usually don't talk in percentages here because you can't spend a percentage. We talk in dollars. That's why we mentioned a 1.5 million. So that's pretty much the message. Well, Does that to, help? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, Maureen. Just to throw in here, Title I means we take a lot of the special ed kids. That's oh, oh is that what it is? Yes. Thank you. And then uh, they transferred that from Rutland, I think, a few years ago. So, um, but also, these questions are something that is for the administration, who we're going to meet with in a couple of mm -hmm. weeks. Uh, the questions that you posed to Jamie now and Linda Woodland earlier, um, threw them right off. Uh, spoke to Linda, had no idea where you wanted to go, what you anticipated from them. They're not schooled in that as of yet. They're working on it, the school committee's working on it, but they're not the ones. When we go to administration in a couple of weeks, that's where, Joe, you've been, that's where we throw in our hat. And we have also asked as a town, all of the town administrators have gone to administration and asked the town, asked the administration to keep their budget at between 3.5 and 4 percent. That's already been done. So now we have to wait until we go to this meeting to see what it is. But to put this on Jamie, sorry, <laughs> in her very first year on the school committee. Um, not even a full year. <laughs> not even a full year. Yeah, she came in last May, so not even a full year. So just that being said, it's kind of not fair and not your expectations of what she can give to you or what Linda can give to you are way beyond their scope at this point. It wasn't so much, Maureen, what they can give to I'm us. I'm just putting it out there, no, George. Not, you don't even have to explain anything to me. You can just keep on going with your meeting. <laughs> just keep on no, going. I think I do have Move to explain along. it. No, you don't have to. I'm okay, all set. I'll explain it to everybody else. Is that all right? Uh, <coughs> they'd rather not. They'd rather go to the Board of Health. <laughs> That's what most of them are here for. Well, it, it certainly it's... George, I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. Explain it to me. The reason... Thank you. The reason we asked the school committee here is they are actually the ones that approve the budget that the administration puts forth to the towns. Is that correct? So it is their purview to understand the process, mm -hmm. I would hope. We're talking over $100 million being mm -hmm. spent. I would certainly entrust that our three representatives understand the process. So the reason we asked them here, Maureen, was so they could carry the message from the Finance Committee to the school committee and in so doing carry it to mm -hmm. the administration prior to the administration finishing up their process. And like I say, I only know what Holden did because it was publicized. They had asked for 3.1 percent. We're asking for something less than that. Although our minimum contribution went up 3.8 percent. So if they can maintain the overall 1.5 million, that's what we'll have to live with. Mm -hmm. So that's why we asked them here, Maureen. It's unfortunate the other two couldn't be here, and it's particularly if anybody had more experience. And I certainly don't want to put any hardship on you, <laughs> okay? We, we're just asking you to carry a message that things are tight in the town. Absolutely. And that's why I'm here. I just wanted to I know. You know, learn, listen, and, and be involved. That's in essence why we asked. Yeah, sure. And we thank you for your involvement. We do. <laughs> now, do you have any questions of us? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions or comments? Yeah, thank you and congratulations on your first uh, finance <laughs> committee uh, meeting, Jamie. I hate you uh, saying. <laughs> one, of the, one of the important aspects of the school committee, Absolutely. in addition to all the other things that they do, is, is budget cognizance and, mm -hmm. and carrying messages like this. You can help us carry the message by having more people carry the message, and that's why we invited you and, and your two compatriots here tonight to uh, impress upon them that we want you to carry the message. Absolutely. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. <laughs> I'm back, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't run away. All right, uh, moving on, we have the Board of Health. Mr. Favreau is going to make a presentation on his operational budget request.
And so I will turn the meeting over to Mr. Favreau. Good evening, all. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Um, the Board of Health has recently, um, as of last Thursday, revised their budget and presented it back to uh, members of the uh, Finance Committee. Uh, one of the key components in our revisions was we had some deductions that we uh, created, we allocated um, in our wages line items. Um, we did have an expense increase. Uh, that expense increase specifically calls out reprogramming four radios. Uh, that expense totaled $450. Um, I trust that you all have copies of this. I did make some additional copies if need be. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to go through the entire budget with you if you'd like, or um, as you can see, we have an overall deduction of 5.16% uh, in our total operating budget. May I have one of those copies, please? Absolutely. Are there any questions? <coughs> yeah, I have a question. Pause. <coughs> On your line item for the Board of Health wages, I mean, it's been a pretty radical increase over the last like four years. <coughs> and we had a step up of 60,000 and the 60,424 in 2023. Mm -hmm. There was a 20, almost $26,000 increase in 24, but then it drops back down. To 73 so it's not quite back to where it was so so what exactly is going on there happy to explain that <clears throat> so in fiscal year 20 um, we only had one line item for a salary um, and at that point uh, fiscal year going into fiscal year 2021 um, we took and we added uh, we separated out meaning all the employees that were in our department some were under wages um, so I'm the only one under the salary line item, which is a salary position. The others are under an hourly position under the wages. Um, in 20, 2022, we had one part-time administrative assistant that went from part-time to full-time. So that's, that explains part of that increase in that time frame. I'm not sure what the other question was. I wasn't... So, so what happened? Oh, like, if you look at 2022 actual, we were at 60,000. Right, so we jumped from four. So we said you said the half. You had someone at 40. It was 41.7 and 21. Jumped up to 60. That would explain going from part time to full time. So then in 23, he goes. The wages are comparable. It's 60,000 for the two. But then when you go to 24, it's another 26,000, almost 26,000 dollar jump. So did we add somebody there? But because the, then the next year in the budget, you, then you drop off. So, so you would think that there were like a one-time hit there or something going on there. So we did reduce some hours here in 2025, uh, which is what you'll see in uh, the twelve thousand two hundred sixty-three dollar deduction. <clears throat> that fourteen and a quarter percent. Um, we cut our hours back. We were budgeting more hours than we were using in those previous years. And each year we kept budgeting a little bit more. Okay. It's hard, like, I understand what you're saying, budgeting more, but that's like a, that's not a little more, that's a lot more. Like, to me, I, I would say that's a significant event. That's like, we hired somebody, we did a major project, we did something, something happened, regulations changed, something happened that would precipitate that big an increase. No, yeah. no regulation change occurred um, during those time frames, during that, that 20 to 25 or 20 to 24 time frame, no regulations had changed. But again, in 2022, we had a part-time administrative assistant that went from 18 hours to 32 hours. In addition to that, we had some other increases in our wages. Um, we also had some longevity increases uh, recently. So those are probably some of the explanations. But to give you the detail of all of the nuts and bolts of where those came from in that time frame, I wasn't prepared to offer that information. But I can assure you that, again, specifically in 2022, or fiscal year 22, there was a, uh, a full-time employee that was brought on from part-time. Okay. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but it's a little big for me, from 22 to 23, but 24 was the, the big step. It was from 23 to 24 that there was a big difference in the wages. So I, I think, and, you said you're not prepared to, we would like to find out why. We would like to know why there's such a big disparity 
and even with the drop down in 25, is still 13,000 above what happened in 23. So again, why? I'll get an answer for you on that. Anybody else have any questions on the board? Well, to build on Paul's question, we have the fiscal year 24 half year actual data. And so the allocated amount was 83500 The expended amount halfway through the year was 32000 So that kind of builds on Paul's comment. It's, it's being underspent. That's correct. That's and if that's what's being used to build fiscal year 25, then it's going to continue to be underspent. So to, to answer your question about being underspent in that case, <clears throat> we took an average over the last three years of what we were spending with our administrative assistant and um, our alternate food and septic inspector. And we had budgeted 16 hours and 12 hours. We've cut them back down to 10 and, and 8, which are more consistent um, yeah. with the past, the average of the past three years. Yeah. And that number, that cut back is reflected here in our fiscal year 25 budget. Anybody else? I have a question and a comment. Um, as your liaison, I guess we met a month or two ago, and I asked you and your board a couple questions. One was, why in this analysis we did here of the cost of Board of Health activity in 11 of their towns of varying populations and activity, why nobody is spending more than $99,000 a year and including benefits, we're spending for over 200000 So essentially, we're spending more than twice as much for the Board of Health Services as these. Do you have this chart? I have seen that. OK, chart. OK. So I also asked you if you would uh, take a look. I know there's a uh, regionalized Board of Health system in the area. You familiar with it? I am. And what's the name of it? Neshoba uh, Board of Health, yeah. I believe you're referring to. Yeah, and part of the towns on here are also on the uh, participants in that regional association on this chart. That's not a question, it's a statement. And I asked you guys if you would take a look at the concept of regionalization, just like the town did with the inspection uh, group. Was it several years ago, Maureen? Five years? Four years? No idea what you're referring to. In going in from a full-time inspector to parsing out the inspection services, the building inspector? The building inspector? Yeah. That was that in the city? Facilities, for example. Facilities. Yeah. Job, yes. Yeah, sharing, sharing and stuff. That's because we, neither one of those jobs warranted a full-time employee. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm getting to. Okay. So... In looking at the association, did you and your board have an opportunity to investigate regionalization and if it could serve the purpose and what the cost would be? Um, you want me to answer? Yeah, I think that would be appropriate. Richard Lane, current member of the Board of Health, interim anyways. So the board has not investigated regionalization as a board. Um, it's determined by the board members that were there prior that that is not the way that they wanted to go. And that's the bottom line on that. Um, however, if you were to investigate that, that is a very, very long, well, it's a long process. It would take a minimum of three years. So it wouldn't even affect this budget or even next year's budget. Uh, and that's only if Neshoba actually decides to let Sterling in. Mm -hmm. um, currently, they would not. And just clearly stated, 
because of the regulations that we have in place. Uh, so that that's it. Bluntly put, that's it. You know, I, you have and because I have spoken to Nashoba myself. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Anything else on that partic in, in particular? No. Okay. Yes. I was wondering what regulation you're talking about. All of them. <laughs> Neshoba and their health agents work differently. So it's not, I know the insinuation would be that it's the, the most recent regulation, but there's more regulations that, uh, that are sterling specific that uh, would cause some rub with the way that they do business. So. I guess you don't want to elaborate. Uh, I don't have the expertise. I would like to elaborate, but I don't have the expertise to elaborate. Um, but I do know that they run under a separate set of regulations, uh, more closely tied directly to Title V. All right. Yeah. Do you have any costs, Richard, when you were doing your little search? I do, but I wasn't prepared to present them because okay. it's it's not even realistic to present it at yeah. this point. Like I said, it's a three-year process, the, at least minimum, where I was told, three years. The Board of Health would have to vote to accept it. The town would have to vote to accept it. And then the, the Neshoba Consortium would have to vote to accept it. They don't like us. Uh, um, they didn't say that. <laughs> they didn't say that. But yeah. some of the, th when I, and it wasn't, my conversation when that, with them was at the 10,000 foot level. Yeah. Because I wasn't even in a position yet, you know, to make any any decisions or anything like that at the time. So it, it was purely investigational, you know, I guess, or, or more to, to satisfy my curiosity. But certainly some of the things that their health agents, well, some of the things our health agent does, they would not do. That was clear. Okay. I've had conversations with them too. So, do you, so did you know the answer to the question? Well, or, how much? No, no. No, it will. You add, okay. On how much they would charge us? No, I don't. Okay. What I do know is it's based on population. Yes, okay. it, it is a set fee per capita. Correct. Uh, and I'm not, I do have it in my notes, but I don't have my notes with me. I, they do things different yeah, than we do. They do. Okay, they're health that's, agent. That's really it. They do things differently. Yeah, than from what I understand, the health agents don't go out on Title V uh, inspections. That's, that's one thing. Yeah. yeah, because by law... When you say Title V, they don't go out on transfer title Correct. Inspections. inspections. Yes. Yeah, because you have to hire a licensed inspector anyway. Yeah. So... That, they, that is... That's one of the things. Yeah. Okay, so that's not nothing in imminently in the next year or two. No. But hopefully we can still investigate as we move forward and always looking at alternative ways of saving money. Everything's on the table. Here. My other question, I don't know if Rich wants to take this or Mr. Favreau who is doing it. Favreau. Favreau. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's a long A. Um, have you looked at any ways that we could uh, even cut the cost down further than what we've been spending lately, maybe reducing clerical staff, because I understand we have a part-time inspector also, and from what you told me, uh, Dave, his function originally was to do inspections that you couldn't do for fear of conflict of interest. Uh, That's no, what you told me last time we met? No, I don't recall stating that at oh. all, George, uh, Mr. Handy. Um, Mr. Moore, the alternate food and septic inspector, was hired for multiple different reasons, but he was also hired to deal with conflict of interest situations that may arise. <clears throat> and do they arise? Any inspections, um, whereas family members of mine would perform a task, that would pose a conflict of interest and it would eliminate me out of that position. Um, okay, so it might come up. All right, I don't have any other questions. Oh, one other comment. Um, when we met, or, or subsequent to that, uh, we had handed out a log sheet. Yes. Uh, and thank you for
for sending it back to us. However, this isn't the one that we had uh, asked you to fill out. Because the one we had asked you to fill out was actually for fiscal year 23 and year to date 24. And you came back with year 22 and 23. Was it? So our permits are all based on calendar years versus fiscal years. Okay, that answers the question. Thank you. <laughs> I have no further questions. Anybody else? Thanks, Dave. Rich, thank you. I don't want questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the next one. A brief recap of the UMass presentation and slides. Uh, Lynn and Liz can lead that discussion. Uh, well, I guess I would say that. Thank you. It was uh, enlightening. It was good to get all that information. Where I've collected feedback from the people who have attended, and I'm going to compile it into one. And We'll have a separate CDC meeting or capital meeting to look at what was presented, what we learned from it, what we think we might want to take action on, and um, we'll report back once we do that. So it's, it'll be basically finding a time for the capital committee to meet outside of these meetings that we have going here. What is anything to add? <laughs> I was supposed to see my name on. Okay. <laughs> that was quick. Are there any other conversations or discussions we want to have here since we have capital budget committee? Were there any other feedback things from the I thought it was great. I thought the presentation was excellent. I thought it was well organized. It was to the point and it was data driven. Yeah. And it had formulas and it was very specific and it was encouraging for me because it's one of the things I've been asking for is targets and I would like to add another target added to it That's, that was a good part of that. And then, again, I'd like that to carry over to FinCom too where we, we have targets so that we're looking at all these numbers and that's just like a sliding ruler where we're measuring them all together in the impact. So it was great. I thought it was great. So Lynn, do you want to receive, in addition to comments on the presentation, any ideas people may have in terms of new items like Paul yeah. just stated? And, and so Paul, it's not too late. Okay, so you already sent yep. the and, new and suggestion. I also asked if people were confused by any of it because I myself learned something <laughs> that I had a misconception of, of how we calculated our target and some other things that I think became clearer to me as she went through her presentation with actual examples. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that uh, I think there's some things we can learn from and some things we ought to set aside to do. One, one big thing that came out was redefine a capital project, and this always kind of bothered me a little bit, as $25,000 and a uh, five-year life, I believe it is. Um, and when we put together all the capital numbers, we have a lot more than that in there. And they suggest separating out those items that don't fall into our definition of capital as you know separate and maybe um, funded from free cash. Uh, but we need to have a process around that. You know how how would we operate that? So it's not applicable to this year, I don't think. Correct. But it's something that. We want to well, I think that once we gather up everyone's comments from this, um, I think that that's part of what we need to do in the fall, is to really fine-tune our process through what has been a very steep learning process for some of us that are relatively new to CBC. So I think that we can really well utilize our time in the fall while we're waiting for capital budget requests to come in on doing some of this foundational work. I agree. I found that they touched on many of the same topics that we as a team have already touched on, like elimination of non-capital items from that budget and putting them in a separate category called projects that aren't capital that need to be funded. We're not talking about taking them away, we're just 
talking about putting them in a different category. That's all. Uh, our capital budget currently, the way we've been working it right now, uh, through no fault of anybody on the committee, has all those items in it, so it is cluttered. It is really not capital. We tended to do a pretty good job, however, of segmenting those line items into the capital category when we talked about CIF funding for those, however, in our budgeting process. And the other comment I'd make is, I guess I'm not surprised to see that their uh, spreadsheet breakdown mechanism paralleled ours exactly mm -hmm. this year. So. Um, I don't know whether we looked at theirs or they looked at ours, but we came together with exactly the same process for doing it, um, which is encouraging. And uh, the other comment I guess I would make is targets are what you decide to include and exclude on it. Um, we are a little confused by the clutter that we have of those projects that we just talked about existing on our capital budget sheet and confusing what the total is that we're looking to fund. And I think it'll go all the way back to the guidance that we give to department heads, boards, and committee heads when we go out, when Bill sends out the information <coughs> in the fall. <coughs> we need to be a little bit clearer on this is how we're defining a capital budget request and we want to know about your special projects. Um, you know, they're smaller, they're not part of your year-to-year um, -year operational budget, um, but it is a funding need that you have. And so it starts there with us giving clarity to the people that are actually working and coming up with the requests. We, we need to make a decision, are we gonna fund them as part of it, an ongoing omnibus because they're or several categories, I would say that some of the Wachusett Greenways and I think the Wachacum yep. uh, funding, they're regular and it's nearly the same amount every year. When they're regular and nearly the same amount every year and they don't meet the capital threshold, my view is we should figure a way of putting them somewhere else, if, if not the omnibus, some other category of, of Yeah, because they end up coming out of free cash anyway. So it's exactly. just, you know. <laughs> right. That's your project sheet. Exactly. <clears throat> Any further discussion on uh, that particular item? Mark? Do you foresee us having uh, interaction with this group, the UMass group? Are they going to give us feedback? Are we going to give them feedback? or? I don't we is, know? Is Bill still here? <laughs> He's probably gone. He's in they, a bank meeting next they, door. They, they do have additional deliverables coming up. I think the next one is sometime in April. Pardon me while I shuffle through my papers. Um, yeah, that was phase three, I think. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think to answer your question, I think we're going to have more interaction with them, Mark, as we close yeah. this. But I, it, and they also have a quote of dollars per hour for additional services. So <laughs> beyond this grant budget amount, I think it's, it's dependent on whether or not we want to pay more. Okay. So I think that I would hope that when the draft CIP is submitted in March, there would be an opportunity for feedback from the Capital Budget Committee prior to creating the final CIP. That's due in April, correct? Yeah. Yes. Perhaps yes. in another Zoom meeting like we had mm -hmm. where, where they presented to us. Yeah. Anything further? Okay, we'll move on. Now the next one is set the next meeting, agenda, topics, date, time. I think we already have one set for next, next Tuesday, Tuesday at yep. 6.30. Yep, here. And we're inviting at least DPW, DPW. and police. Yep. Yes. And historical commission. And historical commission. And then there will be some other agenda items that come forth as we move forward. Um, other old, new businesses. I have some old business. Go. <laughs> the, um, the capital plan that we have been working to is not totally accurate. Okay? And 
So Joe sent out the latest copy that he's got two sheets on it. One sheet is um, the capital plan is Bill and I put out. And then the other is the funding of that plan. Um, when we were comparing some of the fire things, Joe noticed a discrepancy. I went back and reconciled all the initial requests um, and found things that were missing. Back to the original request form. It didn't match. What right. We were doing. I, on the I, funding? Yeah. yeah. I started... Not on the funding, on the request side. On the actual match. request wow. side. Interesting. Yeah, so... So I sent you another sheet <laughs> that he has um, corrected both of those. Um, double check me on everything. But we need to get to a point where everybody agrees this is these are the right numbers. Fortunately, it didn't affect, I don't think it affects the totals in 25 much. There were DPW things out in the future that weren't there. That So I think what happened was a summary was used from last year and then things spliced in and it didn't get updated correctly. So All we did was drop by 3,000. It was, it was inaccurate, so it, and we need to correct it. Yeah, for sure. yeah. but I think more importantly, yeah, yeah. we need to. That's one, that's one of them. One yeah. owner. <laughs> well, not not one owner, but we one. need to really firm up the process by which we review things because I had noticed when we got Bill's first spreadsheet that things were in this year that, according to the department request, were in another year. But I assumed, shame on me, that Bill had had a conversation with department heads, and that's why it had moved. A, a, prime, exa <laughs> a prime example of that so. is, is what Chief Hurlbut spoke about tonight. Yes. The mini splits actually moved back into this year because that's what he requested. And the structural gear replacement for 45K moves mm -hmm. out, out. Oh, to the two succeeding right. years. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So actually the capital amount is lower than we had did all, had done all our work to right. right now. So that's one of the discoveries when Lynn and I were reconciling back and right. forth. We noticed that because we went back to the chief's original request. Yeah. And they were accurate. Okay. Right. And reflected what it was. So, so we have to... I guess we have to certify the inbound. Right. I also, I'm sorry, but you know, I also agree with Lynn. There's too many hands in the pot. Yes. Everybody's touching spreadsheets and editing and modifying it. And sending and, them out to us. And it's confusing. <laughs> it needs to come from one source and right. only one editor. So if you have questions or changes, you go back to the original editor. They need to change. Go back instead of right. And again, hands. I'll say That's it once. I'll here. say it a dozen times. Next fall, we really need to work the process. We are all liaisons to s several departments for their capital requests. Each one of us should be the expert in that. And at a minimum, you take it upon yourself when, when that spreadsheet comes out to look at the ones that you own, because we own them. So, so in, in addition to that, there may be things further that affect this year because Bill made us aware and I'm making you aware that the second phase of the electric windows may be off the table this year. That is not firm yet, but he has a strong suspicion it may come off. So that will okay. have an effect for this year's capital mm -hmm. that we had planned already. So 60, be prepared to that as we roll into well, the go up. In, in, into the March 15th deadline for uh, warrant closes, we may have that discussion as well, and we may have to react to an adjustment that we make in that as well. What Bill told us is the earlier estimate for that is no longer valid uh, because of labor-related estimates that were put into it that are dated. It's going to go up, so it's not in this year's capital. We're have, going to have to talk about it for subsequent year, most likely. And you also mentioned um, in your latest iteration of the spreadsheet to us that there were some additional free cash expenditures for the opioid account and the September storage Correct. account, which we, would have we need to, to about figure out twenty nine thousand. Yeah, those, those, those 20, are not capital; those are in our free project. Free cash, right? Category. Project, but yeah. Yeah. so we will know about that by March fifteenth. I hope we have to. We have to get it locked down. <laughs> okay. So, yes, we have more more work to do. Not 
major work I would put in it, but we need some minor cleanup work here before yeah. we, we can call it so. And when was the Historical Society coming in? Were they next can, week. It's next week, okay. Do you know, I, I know that there was some confusion. I looked back at her initial request and she had 11,000 in for capital for this year. Um, but there was monies that were in the prior year that didn't get into the warrant because we didn't approve them. Um, and so I think Bill told me that she had asked for the, I think it was 8,400 for the painting or whatever. And then I touched base, uh, Mark and I, with um, Goss again because Bill had turned it over, responsibility for that building over to him to see if he had made an assessment. And his, his estimates were, he, his were 18,000 for windows, not 11,000. And um, 14,000 for painting outside and inside. And he thought, he thought those were necessary things to do to preserve the structure as the town meeting last year voted they wanted to do. So, so that makes the request for the restaurant the schoolhouse up to 32,000 32, instead of what we had in there, which was 11,000, I think. Originally. So, well, we'll find out more about it next week. Yeah, so that's another one we need to keep our eye on, I guess. So, Did you get any more feedback from Kathy than that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, they have the requests that they've put in for capital are, are headstone repairs, which yeah. is a running item, it's always around 8,000. The additional funding they requested had to do with the windows, and it was interior and exterior painting, yeah. okay. which they wanted to do, which they put in after the after after initial budget requests. Okay. So that's the other thing. <laughs> There's a process, right? it's flexible, right? like we were talking about. Like everything is always subject to change. So this is yeah. nothing new, right, <laughs> at, at a moment's notice. So yeah, so it was one of the things that it really stood out the, once they did the portico, and it looks, you know, really nice, and it's fresh coat of paint, and it looks really nice in the town, but then the rest of the building doesn't look so good, <laughs> because <laughs> it's not painting, and it's in disrepair. So they, they did that a few years ago, and I was there to help paint it on the interior. Yeah. The, oh, did they? I was talking more about the exterior, because when you make the portico, you, you can really see how much the exterior is worn. I mean, the interior. Because you can debate when when you want to do that. There's a lot that needs to be done in the interior, if you ask me. But um, there wasn't. It would, they just stuck to the, the painting. Anything more on the capital budget other than uh, we will see an updated, newly approved version forthcoming? Mm -hmm. I yeah, I think it breaks into a, a broader discussion, though, George. And capitals inter entwined with uh, projects with. The omnibus budget. That is okay. true. Okay, so if we want to break into that discussion right now. Yeah, I think we can float into that. Okay. And, uh, okay. Yeah, we, we need to provide some clarity around around that because lines were added that we discussed briefly the last time we got together. But the thought process around adding those lines was to take into account our chapter, chapter 90 funding that we get for about 441K and the fair share funding for about 267K that we get every year that almost equals the amount that Brian Meridian and the DPW need to pave 800,000 worth of roadway every year. We'd like to keep that up. So we fall short of that. So then there's a town funding line for roads and sidewalks added to the capital budget as well. Uh, for 200K uh, to cover two years worth because the intent is to bond that 200K and because we tend to bond every other year, we would lump two years worth of bonding into one so that Ryan had 100K each of the years to make up the shortfall that Chapter 90 and Fair Share did not cover for us of the town, giving them 800K rough and tough every year. Um, the result of that 200K funding in the capital budget pulls 250,000 out of the omnibus uh, 
municipal budget, which is a saving to the taxpayers of about 1% by the removal of that. However, when we, when we bond that along with other things, we end up with other line items that we'll talk about the total about 840000 that we put on uh, for the town. Uh, the 15 year financing on that would add about another 79k back into the omnibus budget. So the 250k savings would be offset by a finance charge of just under $80,000. So there's a net savings to the town rough and tough about three quarters of a percent of uh, tax levy increase as a result of, of those movements and that. So it makes financial sense for us to consider doing that. It, additionally, I mentioned the 840K. Well, that is arrived by taking the uh, Sweat Hill drainage issue, which had this year $30,000, and lumping with that the 500K, which is budgeted for next year, pulling it all into this year, putting it on that bond. Um, in addition to that 530,000, they got moved in in total, which we would bond with the same bond that we're talking about with the 200K in roadway. We would also take the 10,000 that was associated with an evaluation of the cemetery wall, uh, which is failing and needs to be replaced, and the 100000 that was budgeted for next year, and also moving that in. That sum total of the 530, the 110000 and the 200 k in the roadway gives you the 840 k that we would, we would finance as a town. Now, are those all 15-year projects? Those are all, they're more than 15-year projects. So the minimum one is a 15-year, so it would, the least common denominator becomes 15 years for that. Yeah, the retention so, bonds can go 30. Yes. Yeah, that sweat hill work is a lot longer than that. So the, the minimum uh, is the 15-year duration, and that's what we would fund through bonding, and that's what the calculation on the principal and interest was done at, that you see in, in the revised omnibus that was sent around earlier today. Uh -huh. Okay, did you find somebody who was knowledgeable enough to say we could, you know, is there a minimum or something that we have to do for the bonding so that we can... There's no problem with the minimum because when you add the water in there, it's about a $2.29 million total bond issue. issue, okay, which exceeds the last bond that we put out two years ago, which was two point one two. Right, I guess what, what I was saying is... If we just looked at the 15-year and kept the 30-year things together, in other words, we don't put it in with we, we have latitude to discuss splitting the bond into a 15 and a 30, and that can be a decision subsequent. The important part is we get this in the warrant, and we get it approved by the town as part of the warrant funding okay. process on it. Then, they have to approve any bond. Yeah. So then, then they can decide what's the most prudent thing for the town bond the water thing at 30, and that's easily bondable for 30 if, you know, the, the water sourcing is 40 years, so it's even longer than that. Yeah. Uh, and you can make side decisions about how to handle that bonding thing, or lump them together. The last time they lumped them all together, and they settled for 10 years because of some of the equipment that was on there that only had a duration that was allowed at 10 years on it. So that's not prudent. So. The things we should do is we should move equipment that would limit our bond duration out of that and fund it to capital. And I did that in the most recent. There was the 209K that the chief talked about tonight. We originally had that as a bonded item. Well, that got moved, as you see in the latest one, moved into capital. So there was a little give and take, but the net effect is a benefit to the town as a result of that in terms of to raise an appropriate amount that we have to go after. You'll have to look at the things I added that were missing. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, I, I kind we'll of just it. threw them wherever they used to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the one thing I would say is when you move, when you move that money out of the well, operating work expense that we've had, you know, the impact, this is why I want, want would like to have targets. So what's the impact of free cash? Right? So there's multiple targets where you need to balance. I'm not saying not to do it, 
but it makes sense. We keep talking. I'm, I'm always concerned when we talk everything in isolation. Right. This is A plus B plus right. What What's the overall picture? What's the overall going to impact? And there's multiple numbers we have to balance, and we're not balancing those numbers. We're just picking an item and we're saying, well, we should do this. Instead of saying, let's look at all our targets. Not to say that we don't do that, but to say, maybe it makes sense to leave 200000 in because of free cash in that category. Not to not do what we're doing, but just saying that we need to understand it as a balancing act. So, well, well, that discussion I just held, Paul, yeah. was a holistic view. We looked at capital and all the money we're spending, and we looked at omnibus. And we, we looked at the goal that George has set to, to try and reduce the municipal piece of that to 400K as well. Right. So, so we come close, okay, on the omnibus goal. Okay, we, we're not quite making it, but we're close. Well, again, we have a reserve fund. We have a capital right, stabilization fund. We have free cash. Those are all funded, okay, in accordance with what our goals are. Okay. And we had an agreement letter on two of them which held us to a stabilization funding amount and an OPEP funding amount. I don't want to get George started. I'd like another agreement yeah. letter, John. Right, we have commitments. Yeah. So, so we funded those commitments accordingly. I think, I think the last element that I want to put up on the table is the free cash that's left over after we do all the movement that we just talked about is about a quarter of a million dollars, okay? Putting on the table right now is we can put that back in to fund the omnibus budget and further bring down the levy. That is the taxpayers' money that they put into the system last year. Using that as a proposal to fund part of the omnibus budget and try and make our goal, because we know that we're probably going to have a school challenge this year, would get us closer to the overall goal that we're talking about right now and return that money to the taxpayers as a result of that 250 k it'd be about another 1% advantage in the levy. So we wouldn't have to raise an appropriate. So George sent us out the revenue forecast going all the way up to 2029. So we do have our fiscal year 25 revenue side. What's our level of confidence in that number, George? Actually, it's not too bad. So now, we're at 27.4 mil. Right. Let me let me address this. Because Paul's right. You need, you need some targets. So I'm going to give us a target, which actually comes from administration. The available funds for the operating budget for FY25 are 27,404,000. It's arithmetic, okay? Are they accurate? They're probably understated as they are every year. And part of that is to help seed free cash, okay? We all know that. However, one of the problems we're having, let's assume we look at the 27,404,000. Then let's take a look at where we are on an omnibus budget. Yep. Which is 28,480. Mm -hmm. So we seem to be a little short. A tad short by about a million dollars. Now, we're not short a million dollars. Why? Because in the omnibus budget, we still have the ambulance cost. And as we all know, part of the funding, which is not included in the revenue, is a swap between the ambulance receipts and the general fund to offset ambulance costs. Okay. Historically, historically, it's not historically, and it's not a written policy. Over the last year or two, it's been a half a million dollars. Matter of fact, going back to uh, twenty. Ambulance of Until fiscal year 20, the ambulance funds that were transferred from the receipts into the general fund always met or exceeded the ambulance budget. And that, I'm sure, was the rationale on transferring the funds out into the general fund 
so that the taxpayers weren't digging in their pocket to subsidize the ambulance, particularly where we do so much um, mutual aid. Mm -hmm. Okay, they didn't want the taxpayers paying our people to go to Clinton. So it was a good idea at the time. You transfer in a half a million dollars, it covers the cost. Well, in fiscal 21, there was a, uh, a reversal of fortune, we may say. And the 500000 as of 21, never covered the cost, nor the budget. So we've been stuck on the path of keeping the 500000 static. I have no idea why. It doesn't make any sense anymore because now it's an arbitrary number. At least it had a meaning before it would cover the cost. I'm suggesting, since we have a budget for ambulance of, I don't know what, 650, mm -hmm. that we actually target transferring 650 from the ambulance receipt fund to the general fund to offset the ambulance budget. So instead of a million dollars, do they have 650 yeah, they have plenty. They, matter of fact, last year they had 684,000 in receipts oh, wow. okay. on top of the 600 they had in the reserve. They get plenty of money. So that'll zero that out. Okay. So yeah, that's an hour. So instead of being a million dollars short, just by making that one transition, we're three hundred fifty thousand dollars short. Plus, if their ambulance receipts come over six. Well, I, be I think if we're going to set a policy that's rational, you might have want to define it as a rational policy, which is transferring out of the receipts into general fund equivalent of the budget number. Now you have a definition of why you're doing something. It's not an arbitrary number. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As opposed to a half a million dollars. Why? Because. Right. So I, that's one change I'm suggesting, and that brings us to within $300,000, so, or three fifty. So getting pretty close. Okay. If we weren't set upon trying to preserve the $500,000 of excess levy capacity. Mm -hmm. Remember, that was one of the goals we set out, yeah. not to diminish that. We could use 350 of the excess levy capacity, right. and we're there. we're there. But now we only have 150,000 of excess levy capacity. Now, what's the caveat? It's not all that good. The reason we're here is because of the bylaws, any new personnel additions have to survive on their own warrant article. Mm -hmm. So whether it's one fireman, two firemen, or 40 firemen, they, their costs actually have to come out of the omnibus budget. Including the benefits? Everything. Mm -hmm. And come out on their own just for this year. Article. Yeah. Okay. So. And we did that in the most recent version you saw. Ha, has fire? Yeah. Did we take them out? I, yeah. You we did. You okay. And I figured out what the numbers were. And those were taken out, and a note was put at the bottom of the omnibus regarding the fact that we need that article. So essentially, that was I think seventy-seven thousand in wage, and roughly thirty-five thousand in ish. Yeah in benefits, which is family medical insurance, which costs 30000 something, and another $8,000 for Medicare and pension contribution. So that has already been abstracted from this, okay, because it's going to be its own Warren article. Mm -hmm. That's so, why you see a low number in that increase for this year. Right, right. of 30 something thousand. So, if we successfully figure out how to get the revenue to match the expenses on the omnibus budget, there's another $100,000 of operational cost in the new firefighter that the town meeting is going to have to make a decision on, okay? And how we present our 
recommendation on that article is going to be something we're going to have to discuss. Mm -hmm. Are we going to support it? Are we going to support it with a caveat? How are you going to fund it? Um, so, or are we not going to support it and say, we just can't afford it this year, let's see what next year comes up. How so do they handle other revolving funds? Like, REC has input, and, you know, has... They have, they have their own ability to spend those monies for their own purposes. Okay. Okay, that's out. Recreations has the authority to spend her revolving accounts on recreational programs. Ambulance doesn't do that. Okay. And building inspections and other things that... Those go right things. into the general fund. That's okay. part of... When you see the revenue on this revenue chart... They have it there. Yeah. It's, it's in the local receipts. Okay. Okay. That includes virtually everything except ambulance. Okay. That includes the Board of Health fees, the building fees, and everything else. The building department actually contributes quite a bit of money over and above their cost. I mean, they're, they're quite a profit center. Anyway, so I don't want to drag this out any longer. That's where we are right now, okay. just to bring everybody up to speed. And th that I think that's a measurable target, Paul. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Is that is that pretty good? All right. I just, I just like having it on one page. I like having it on right. one target. Right. You can literally see it. You know, if we do this, this is what it, you know. The number you can literally see the numbers change and say, you know, it illustrated so that p other people can see it. When we no, can I mean, make our point, we can say, well, this is what when you decide this, this is what happens. You got to remember, Paul. This is the first year, believe it or not, that we've had actually a funding program for capital expend capital and projects. Sorry, capital and project expenditures. So that sheet eventually should be linked, obviously, okay, to the omnibus. Mm -hmm. So it'll do, like you say, when you change dollar one over here, it changes dollar one over here. Because they are, not in large part, but in some part, connected. connected. Yeah. But, but not to a great extent. Free cash has nothing to do with the omnibus budget. The capital uh, reserve fund has nothing to do with the omnibus budget. The only thing that really interplays is what are you going to fund? Because that's converting capital to operations, right? We talked about that earlier this year. So, but yeah, in an ideal world, those two are going to be married. Mm -hmm. And then we will have it all in one place. Unfortunately, right now it's scattered all over Manhattan, mm -hmm. like you said. And unless you're doing it every day, which none of us do, we don't get paid to do Well, we do get paid. And it's a huge amount of money. <laughs> Is anybody else taking a stab at putting it on one page? It, it'll happen in the off-season, probably. Yeah, an off-season. Joe can do it, yeah. Paul can do it, I can do it, Izzy can do it. I mean, it's there's no magic. It's just a it's a time factor, not a how-can-you-do-it factor. Right, Paul? Any? Izzy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's... Yeah, there's no magic. It's just you, you got to set the time aside. And none of us have the time right now. Okay, but we'll do it out in the off season. Either you guys have time? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, Paul's out snowboarding, <laughs> and he's running out of season in snow. <laughs> so we'll probably get this done for next year, but uh, it's not going to be done this year. Okay. So yes. that is the whole point about starting earlier next year. Yes. If we start earlier, we'll have the cycles to get it the way we want. Yeah. And what I was hoping for is we have the template, like where we have a building block where we can literally see the numbers move when we make those decisions. Exactly. It just makes, it just makes our conversations easier. Yes. I, I am working on a five-year funding plan based off of the capital budget right now. So I have built a database and I built a pivot off of that. So we should be able to start discussions for our next fiscal year. How are we going to fund next fiscal year? Because um, that's what leads into that conversation. To continue on from your point, which is, you know, we can move that money, and we can change it down to hundred thousand, right? Mm -hmm. But where are we going? Yeah, right? so you're you're try it we're not really, we're not really <coughs> helping ourselves because we're not solving the issue. We're not really solving the issue. We're just spending too much. We're doing what we call, what the government calls continuing resolution. We're just kicking the can down the road. We're not really addressing the core issue. Yeah. So, and that that's part of why we're going to talk about firemen independently at some point when, as we go into further deliberations. But another advantage we have starting early next year, we never had a revenue projection before. 
Right. Although it's been <laughs> mandated that we're supposed to have one, this is the first year we ever had one. So when we hit the road next year, we can hit it running. We already know what it is. Yeah. Figuring out what the um, levy limit is is no magic. It's 2.5% plus new growth, period. I mean, and, and that's going to make up the, the majority of what we have to spend. And local receipts is it? How's it look for next year? Now, Bill did mention one thing that for the local receipts, he uses two hundred thousand every year. Last year was three thirty-five because there was a blip. Okay, this year is probably going to be closer to two. Next year, he's expecting another um, blip for some big project that's going on. I, I don't know if it's the the apartments down on uh, Research Road or. Somebody else is doing a lot of building, but he's expecting another bump, but still using 200, which he should, because it's conservative, but it's it's been a tried and true number. So this flexibility, we all know that it's underestimated on this. That's good news. But anyway, that that's all I have to say. So we'll get there, mm -hmm. but not this year. <laughs> well, I feel more comfortable because when I looked at these numbers this afternoon, and looked at a $1.1 million gap. Discrepancy, yeah. It was a big gulp on my part. Yeah, where so, are we going from here? Yeah. yeah. So thank you for that explanation. Yeah. <laughs> I can sleep tonight. One other comment on the capital. I'm going to say that Joe is the updater, since you have the funding portion that you still need to manipulate a little bit. If anybody has any corrections or additions, um, certainly keep us informed, but Joe will be the one who will update. I'm more than happy. Okay. I, He's got I, plenty of time. I know. Well, <laughs> I sent you what I had okay. in reconciliation. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. And, uh, if I had more time, it would have been done today. I know, I know. No, that's all right. <laughs> now, are there anything else anybody want to talk about on this or any other new old business? Any com Yeah, Liz. Just the article. Oh, the article. For Sterling Meeting House News. So oh, yes, I yes, sent yes. out one version. I highlighted. Uh, feedback came to me to uh, take out that entire paragraph, which gives the article a very different flavor. flavor. Yeah. And it would definitely require a new title. <laughs> so I wrote. Now you decide as a committee. Well, who gave you the feedback and what was the rationale? Me. Okay. On striking the whole thing? The rationale was that actually the figures aren't accurate. Okay, um, they're really not going anywhere, and the summation and interpretation of where they came from is incorrect. So aside from that, I think it's okay. Okay, but I've already told Liz that, and. So you wanted to hear it. And Liz pointed out she got all this information from pre-posted um, items. And maybe so. But I got to tell you, our municipal spending is not $13 million. It's $27 million. Okay? Yeah. Municipal operating expense might be 13 million, but municipal spending is 27 million. So you can't make bad statements in a report you're going to publish in a newspaper. All right. Okay. So again. And it, the municipal spending of 27 million dollars, which is the true number, hasn't gone up 7.68 percent. It's gone up 5.1 percent over the last five years. Okay. And the summation that the reason there was such growth, I think it's supposed to be municipal operating budget, was because of new hires and insurance is also not correct. The largest driver was the compensation study two years ago that drove the payroll up 10.6%. The payroll is $6 million. That was the biggest driver of the increase. Okay? So that's why I'm against putting out numbers like that. I think the whole article is nice, except for trying to 
voice numerical opinions in a newspaper article. I'm sorry, that's my opinion. I'm done. You asked. It's, no, it's a valid <laughs> point because numbers, because um, we're still fluctuating numbers all over the place. Exactly. Way, so trying to put them out at this point in time is probably not wise. Um, I think that understanding, I, I don't know if a lot of people understand levy limits or two and a half for the concern um, for, you know, approaching the need for a, a prop two and a half override if we're not careful about our spending. Um, I think that's kind of a valid point to make, that that's one of the concerns we have as a committee, is that we, our levy limit is deteriorating. Or right, our, and that we did that in the levy limit concerns paragraph. Without maybe specifically saying that's the numbers. That's in the conclusions, not in that middle section. It's the middle section I don't like. You gotta, you gotta remember your audience, right? So, yeah. so when you send out to, to the landmark, right, who, who's gonna read that? Is it the article is designed for the Sterling residents, right? The, the Sterling taxpayers, right? So the taxpayers are not gonna be, they're not, they're not gonna wanna hear about two and a half proposition or any of that stuff. They always ask the same question. Does that mean my taxes are going up? That's the only question they're gonna ask. And how high? Yeah, and how high? That's, that's really, the, you know, death and taxes. Right, yeah. and how much? Mm -hmm. So usually that's the question, you, you just have to tailor the message towards that. And the, the article is just basically saying, hey, we're coming up to the point where your taxes are gonna go up. We don't really say how much, but we're saying that. But my initial question to you was. Do I wanna rephrase it? Reading the annual report. No, the reason why I, I got volunteered into writing this. <laughs> <laughs> Was my question to the committee was, we've just spent several meetings talking about a three to four page document that is the finance committee's annual report. And how many of you think anybody reads that annual report that's sitting here? And so if there's an important message in that annual report that we want to get out to taxpayers, then let's choose a different avenue. And I had suggested the Meeting House News because that goes free to everyone in Sterling. So that would have been, and that was the agreement, was there is some message in the annual report that we want to get out there. What so, Paul was saying is that the message. Okay. Well, and, and, and that's what that's, I was contending that's, that's is fine. that section is not the message we want to get out there. Okay. So that was my contention. I like everything else about the letter. Okay? But, that we work hard, we do our job, these are our goals, and uh, that's, we're going to try to get there. I think it's wonderful. But that doesn't really say anything in terms of any concerns that we may be looking at, not only for this annual town meeting, but the spending patterns are going to be sort of snowballing for future years. So I so guess anybody concerned that, about that has a TV set and yeah, can but, watch us. Uh, I, there was a Concord, <laughs> going back to Concord again, but they talked about, okay, as the Finance Committee looked at the current year, our expenditures are exceeding our revenue. And we're trying to get the two into line. And if we don't, then we're facing tax increases or an override. So that's a message I think they could understand. If you if you talked about if we just said that what in looking at the requests for the current year, we're seeing a trend where our expenditures are growing. Some we don't have any control over. Schools, school costs, we have minimal control over. Um, insurance and other things we have minimal control over. Um, and the revenue is not increasing at the same rate the expenditures are. So we're on a collision course where at some point we're going to be looking at either 
a, a tax increase, period. You know? So we're trying to stave that off by doing our due diligence, but that's the trend. And maybe that's, Liz, maybe that's the thing to, to well, say. Yeah. Is that rather than specifics about, you know, trying to give numbers or, or that, yeah, we had a compensation plan a year ago and that's affecting us this year. And uh, in fact, this is the first year that all of those, the two contracts and the compensation study are all hitting fiscal 25 as... Well, and we st stated that. I mean, I took... The last paragraph on the second page of the annual report that starts with the four-year average increase of 7.38% in municipal spending is due in large part to, and then, you know, staffing, compensation, all of those things. So I thought that that was a message that was important enough to people because right after that is this has caused an erosion of our excess level capacity to levels below $1 million, which limits our flexibility. So I broke that into to two bullets, but that was what I thought was the most important part of the annual report. And you know, in terms of future messaging, not what we did in the past, but here's where our concern is. <coughs> yeah. So if we want this to be a concern article, we need to figure out how to word it if you want it to be an article that just says, here's what we're doing, and... I think it needs more, it needs some meat in there, but to Paul's point, I think that we're concerned about the excess level capacity doesn't ring to the average citizen. You know, but if you say, hey, our expenses are exceeding our revenue, people can understand that. That's a regular budget thing, you know? But, yes, sure. I, yes. but they aren't right now. Roseanne was first, so let's okay. recognize yeah. Roseanne first. I just wanted to, to say something here. So somebody who's not a numeric person at all. Yeah. And if you want to get a message out to me as yeah. that I can understand, I think that it's, it, Liz is, and you are 100% correct. We don't need the, the nitty grit, mm -hmm. gritty. We just need the, the, the state of the town, yeah. basically, you know, just... You can throw some numbers in there too if you want, but they don't. When you're talking, you know, millions of dollars doesn't mean anything to me. It just, you know, it it, it does. Believe yeah, me, know, it does. I but um, I I think it's more advantageous and more. It's easier to read and for people to understand in their busy days. The, the state of the town, and um, we are cautious in what we do, and this is our, you know, just basics, just really basics. So I, I think that. The words better than numbers sometimes. Okay. Lauren well, and Rich also. I was wondering if you if you feeling any trickle effect from uh, people leaving the state. Not really. So. Not really. Um, this town's population has been stable since people rode on horses. So it's around eight thousand. It's always been around eight thousand. Demographic has changed. Yeah, it's getting older. older people, less younger people. Yeah. Are you, talking, Laura, are you talking about us specifically, or we're getting older too? <laughs> or well, I mean, I got one of those crazy robo calls. I mean, from you know these survey things asking me if I was intending on moving out of the state within the next year. So you, <laughs> well, were, you were talking at the state level, though. Yeah. 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 They're, they're looking to see, you know, who's moving out, you know, because they got all these immigrant people coming in. They're, they're coming in, they're taking all the resources, and the people with the money, you know, that might live in Sterling was selling their houses and moving to North Carolina for, you know, an easier life. So, because it's less expensive to live there. You know, better climate, too. Well, I think... <laughs> better climate. Better climate, yeah. <laughs> I so, think that it's very optimistic that we have a revenue forecast that shows fair share. Um, dollars at a level amount because that is what is happening is that the people that are subject to fair share tax, the millionaire tax, are moving out. Yeah. So that money may go down over the coming years. Um, but to what extent? I don't know. Because also if you live in Massachusetts, you know you're going to get really good health care. Well, that was, you know, I listened to um, State Senator Peter Durant on the uh, on the record on Sunday morning, and they were um, talking about um, how 
the state and the Senate and uh, the representatives are trying to work on how to make Massachusetts less lucrative looking. Because, you know, Texas isn't going to give you what Massachusetts gives you, mm -hmm. right? Florida doesn't give you what Massachusetts gives you. If you look at, for healthcare, just as an example, all the lower states, they have no Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. So uh, once you're 20 years old, you can't get Medicaid um, okay. expansion, right? Mm -hmm. So here in Massachusetts, you have mandatory health care. So we're, all these people from the south, they're shipping everybody up here on a bus, okay? So they're coming up north, where all the blue states are up north, okay? They give you all the amenities. So that's where they want to come. So they're eating up the, the money out of the state budget, all right? And so the people are moving out and not paying, you know, to offset it. So that could be a situation you might end up here with, you know. Rich, did you have something? Yeah. So Rich Lane Tang with Rue. Um, I was really happy to hear that you guys are considering putting uh, an article in the Meeting House News uh, because I think the people in town need to hear from uh, FinCom. It's not something that they normally see or hear unless they go to town meeting. And I think it's something that they need. And I think it would be great if it was a regular thing. The other side of that is um, I think it needs to be plain English. It needs to be blunt. I think people do recognize if you say there may be a two and a half override coming, bells and whistles go off in people's heads in this town. All right? That is not a popular thing in this town. So, you know, to reference a possible two and a half override is, a, is, is something that, you know, would get people to look at it. I would also suggest that as you're proofreading it and going through it as a committee, keep it to three minutes. So as you read it, if you keep it to three minutes, a lot of people will pay attention. It's like a psychological benchmark, you know. Um, so just just some, some things there. But I think that's great because uh, the communication really needs to increase and get better. So thank you for that. Thanks, Rich. Yeah. I think we hit the brevity part. <laughs> Well, for, for Sterling Meeting House News, I have to do 500 words. Yeah, right. So, and I think we're at 350 or something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, less is more. <laughs> well. All right, any other comments? So, uh, yes. Yes, um, Liz, in your article, are you going to refer the readers to the um, town report if they have, they need more detail? Yes. Like mm -hmm. part? I said for a more in-depth understanding okay. of the committee's operations, interested parties are encouraged to review the comprehensive annual report available okay. at the municipal building. Yeah, yeah. that would do it. So yeah. always point them to the original yeah. source. Otherwise it will get little read, but if it appears in the <laughs> newspaper, you're going to get more read. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Um, speaking about the annual report, um, the past several years they've come up really late. Yeah, they do come up all the and, time. And yeah. people don't have a chance to read them, uh, to look them over. So we're going to the, the town meeting blind mm -hmm. because we have no idea what's in it because we haven't had time to absorb it. We haven't had time to study it, one versus the other and everything else. It usually and doesn't come out until after the town meeting. It usually comes out like one or two days before. Oh, one or two you days know. Yeah, we're talking the warrant. There's yeah. two yeah, articles. Warrant, yeah. There's an annual report oh, and a warrant. Right, right. The warrant is what, what we're going to vote on. The annual right. report is what did we do last that year. Was, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if the warrant came out earlier, that would be really a blessing. You know, because, because you can't ask people to make a decision on the fly. Yeah, we're going to spend $28 million. Tomorrow, how do you vote? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, That's why it's a tough one. Typically, everything passes. Yeah, yeah sure, right. we're not. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that's also yeah, right. why the recommendations of this committee are very profound mm -hmm. for town meeting, because that's why we're here. We're mm -hmm. actually the ones that are taking the time to digest all this stuff and then make a recommendation right. to the townspeople who just got the report yesterday. Right. Okay, we've been doing this since, what, October, September? And uh, so hopefully... 
people pay attention to what we have to say in there. There's been a lot of work by us, a lot of work by the select board, a lot of work by yeah. Bill and the accountant. I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into this to set the stage for next year and try to stay in the confines of two and a half. And with the way the economy has gone, the cost of wages has gone nuts over the last few years, and inflation, trying to stay within a two and a half limit year in and year out is getting increasingly more the, difficult. The annual reports are great. It's just that, the, you know, the, the time warrant. Warren, yeah, really, if it came out earlier, really it would be terrific. Really negligible, yep. <clears throat> yep. I agree. So can I go back to the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I wanted to just um, say something. You, you made a reference um, to an article that you saw in the landmark. I think um, it was about Holden, okay? There was somebody, one of the reporters did an article in the landmark about Holden. Holden, uh, this is about the school budget, okay? I've lived in this town for 36 years, and I've never been to a town meeting where Sterling never says no, okay, to the budget, okay? So the article that I read in the landmark was talking about how Holden is the last town to have their annual town meeting. So they're on the hook, okay? So they're like cringing like this, okay? Like what is everybody else gonna do in this district, all right? So, you know, what is it? Rutland and Paxton, they usually historically say no to everything, okay? So um, it's, um, to um, teach Jamie over here, okay, that there's an inflation in this, school budget, okay? I don't know if they have too many secretaries for a secretary for a secretary for a secretary. I don't know where the inflation is and the overhead is in, in the district, but there's something somewhere. So how do you work with the, um, the district to make the cuts there so that that can come down so that other towns surrounding us don't have to hurt either? Okay, generally speaking, which is one of the reasons we invited Jamie here today. It is, it is the duty of the school committee to approve the school's budget. The administration is going to come to them and say, we want to spend $108 million next year. This is how we're going to do it. What do you think? Now, I was on a school committee many years ago. One of the problems with that is very similar to like getting a town warrant one day before town meeting is we pay the school administration millions of dollars every year to put together a budget and you have I guess 17 people now that volunteer for school committees which is a really thankless job I, I commend you <laughs> to go once a week or so for the administration to tell them what they're going to do and then you take these 17 people that have been there once a week for six months and say okay we're going to spend 108 million dollars next year does anybody have an objection to anything and they say no but what are they going to say you've just because spent they care about the kids you spent a million dollars to hire people that are theoretically professionals at their job, which is administrating a school system. So, I don't know, where do you go? So, what we do, hopefully, and we're going to start a trend, I think, from a finance committee perspective, is imploring, and hopefully, like Joe said, we'll start a little earlier next year, on what can we actually afford in carrying that forward. Just like holding to this year, their finance committee sent a letter out, not just to the the superintendent, he sent it to their select board, he sent it to every other town in the district on what they're looking for. There's no reason not to join in on that affair, okay? So, they used to vote against the school budget regularly every year, back in the teens. They would go back, they'd shave off 200,000, they'd go back to everybody and everybody say, okay. And over the last four or five years, nobody says no anymore. They don't. Not even Rutland, okay? Because they've gotten such a favorable shake from the state, they're barely paying anything to send their kids to school. 
They pay $5,500 a year per kid to send to watch use it. We pay 10400 for a student from Sterling. You didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Very big deal. Holden pays $7,700 a year. Why we pay 10400 Why? The formula the state uses. Okay. That's all I, and that's how it is. That's what the state mandates we pay. It's amazing. Yeah, so anyway, Princeton is close to us as yeah, well. Yeah, they're 10,000. That's to do with median income. Yeah. Oh, the median income. Well, it's income and the value of the land and how big is your school population. So in the state's eyes, we have too much money in this town for the number of kids we have. So if we had twice as many kids, we'd be paying $5,000 too. But we don't. So anyway, that's all we can do with the school. And hopefully we'll get better as a group as time goes on and in imparting what we need okay and but it's a it, it's a marathon not a sprint and we're we're in it for the long um, run the yeah. article that i read you know just kind of indicating that other towns are having budget problems too just like you uh, everybody does yeah, every year do. yeah uh, do, they, do they provide a, a line item thing yes. for expenditures and because i see that Eventually, you know the yes, right. the 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 price for the school department goes up and up and up, but yet the teachers pay more and more and more, and their pay let their pay is essentially less and less and less because they buy paper, they buy you know all sorts of things that are needed in the classroom. When in my day, it was all supplied by the school. Actually, um, the teachers, the teachers' unions agreement is really not a bad deal. Okay. So when you see teachers are getting a 3% raise, it's like when you see town employees getting a 3% raise. Nobody gets a 3% raise. There are step plans in the town and in schools. In governments, merit raises don't exist anymore. If you look at our warrant last year, we actually changed a bylaw. You never noticed this. I've got to tell you this one. <laughs> and we took the word merit out of a bylaw when they were discussing raises. And it was voted by town meeting. They struck the word merit. I, I, I got a kick out of that. So what they do is longevity. If you're here for three years, you get more money than you do for two. Are you good at your job? Doesn't matter. You're still here. And this is the same with teachers. They get stepped. And if they get a master's degree, they get a bigger step. And then they start a new step program. So uh, we have kindergarten teachers making eight ninety-two thousand dollars a year. Just, I don't know. They're, they're worth it. They've been here a long time. So will we go back to the merit thing as opposed to a step thing? No. You never go back. Because <laughs> yes. there's lots of people who, I'm not saying in this town, but there's lots of people who... I worked in government, um, not government, but government protocol. I worked for Raytheon, and uh, we got merit. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of people who really shouldn't have even gotten merit raises because they just didn't do their job. So okay. here, that's yeah. out of the picture. <laughs> uh, they were there in the third year from the second, so they got a raise. It's yeah. beyond our control. Let's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> crazy. So hopefully we'll be able to do something with the schools like we can with the municipalities as we move forward. We try hard. Does anybody have an audit done? The school, yeah. As a matter of fact, long. that's why they have a new administration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a problem with them before, yeah. It was seven years ago, too, when the other administration was asked to leave. Their finance guy was... I think Ben may have had it. Yes. I just had a question about longevity. In private industry, there's a, there's a cap. You can be, I was, I worked for a company for 42 years. And I made a lot of money because I was there for 42 years. But at some point, they just said, hey, look, we're not going to just keep paying you more money just because you've been here every year. <laughs> you know, at a certain point, they either say, get out. Or, or here you are, you're maxed or out. Or here it is, you've maxed. Well, the way it works. Without a union. I, I understand, without a union. No, I'm talking non-union people. Last year, in our warrant again, by the way, they, they changed the STEP program. 
the, the municipal employees in this town used to cap out at 15 years. They would get, after they're here 15 years, they get a 3% bonus every year, okay, on their pay. That got struck down. Now they cap out at 35 years, and it's no longer a percentage of your pay. It's a flat rate. So it's like $3,500 a year as opposed to... $10,000 for the fire chief. Well, um... Longevity. He said it. I heard yeah, it. His was actually overdue. His is a combination of a couple of years, and that was because of it was neglected for two or three years. And that It came all in one lump sum. It wasn't just... It was a couple of years' worth. And... To be honest with you, he's worth every dime. He's I'm not questioning whether well, he's worth it or not. No, I'm just saying that was a couple, that was a few years. <laughs> okay, but yeah, they they changed that last year too. Well, the voters did. You guys voted for it. Again, we never see the. I know. <laughs> 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 Good point. Any other questions, comments? I have a comment that tying it back to the school committee challenge that we talked about. Uh, Jamie, Sue, and Linda have a challenge in that they kind of get a first glimpse on the 29th of February. They have very little time to look at it, react, and influence on it. And then we get a, a, a deeper dive glimpse of that on, on March 13th, I believe, is when the select board and the school administration is going to meet on that. So. There's a very compressed time schedule, I think Roseanne mentioned it, is that news comes in so late, you have hardly any time to react to it. So I have sympathy with, with the school board having to learn this information and then discuss it and react to it in that very short time span. Uh, we have the meeting on the 13th. Our warrant closes on the 15th of March. <laughs> Maybe we need to bring that, that, Isn't that amazing? on that back. It's it's amazing. It would be wonderful if, if the school had a discussion about, you know, we had to start earlier, but it never changes, Roseanne. So at least it hasn't, so. it hasn't changed in the three years I've been kind of work, working on that. We can ask for the but warrant closing to get pushed back. We don't have town meeting until May. That has to be printed. Well, specific, print, what is print, okay, the, the printing thing, Liz, is interesting. I used to be in printing before copy machines were high speed, and it used to take an act of Congress to get 2,500 copies of something printed that was maybe 40 pages. Now you put it in a copy or press a button, go to sleep, and it comes out stapled in color. So... I, I, I get a kick when they say, we got to get it to the printer. Yeah, okay, get it at 6, pick it up at 9. It's not a real act of magic anymore. I'd like specific guidance for this article, please. Yes, uh, and wrapping back to that, ah. <laughs> and, and Liz has a March 1st deadline. That's right. To get this done. And then I believe I will also say, maybe inaccurately, that you have intentions of making one the next month. April and maybe 1st. the next month. May right? first, yeah. yes. Uh, so we are going to be on this cadence of doing it. Uh, don't be silent, committee, about your comments and get them to Liz so that she can refine this and hit the deadline that I, we have to hit here. Well, we have a 400 word limit that we're trying to live under, and right. we want to make this impactful, but at the same time, you know, maybe tone down some of the finance committee speak in it a little so bit. Uh, so you can either give me some specific guidance tonight or by uh, by Thursday please so that I can work on it Friday and in specific because I would like to return it for the February 27th meeting because then I'm really feeling under the wire. Yeah, good yeah. idea. I have to. Yeah. And yeah, it should be finalized on the 27th. So, so, so George, I'm going to ask specifically, George, this paragraph that we want to eliminate, can you try to reword it and get it okay. to I will Liz, try, Liz, and wait a minute. can you try, Paul? Well, sure. Liz asked me if I could reword it, yep. and I gave her an answer. I'll Is give you the right? same one. No. 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 And, and it's, it's I don't want anything to do with that 
it's a section. It's not fair to George. It's not fair to George. Um, what I want from you is, and I don't want you to write a paragraph. I just want you to give me a couple of bullets of little concise ideas, and then I can work off of that. Okay. Don't try to write it. That makes sense. <laughs> because you're not going to get it to me in time. <laughs> but I've got Friday that I can work on this. So please just give me a general sense, and then I can wordsmith it. Okay. And I will... You have my general sense. Yes, no. Liz, no. <laughs> um, and then I will... See, I am doing our next meeting after, after the February 27th. I will give you the outline of no, but where we're going with the April issue. And the final paragraph on that one will be a call to action go to the annual town meeting because the May issue will come out after the town meeting. So I, I have the outline for the three. I th thought I had a sense of where this one was going based on prior conversations. I can adjust, but just give me bullets, please. Thank you. Hi. Any other comments? You want yes. to mention? Thank yes. you for the work you're doing. Well, thank <laughs> you for saying that. Is there a motion to leave? Did you want agenda items for next meeting, though? I sent them to mm -hmm. Joe. Yeah. And get them to Joe by tomorrow night, because his no. Herein lies the problem. We meet on Tuesday. We have to have the agenda posted 48 hours, 48 business hours before. But since the town hall closes at noon on Friday, Val has to get them into town hall by noon on Friday. So if we can get him to Joe by Wednesday night, he'll be able to at least have Thursday to get him to Val. Because that way, it, it's always a fire drill. And, and Val not screaming at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Is there a motion to go away? Mm -hmm. So moved. Second? Second. Let's go. All right.